In this presentation, we're going to review the basics of the Louisiana Tort Claims Act and contrast it with the Federal Tort Claims Act. This is good background for lawyers that will be practicing in Louisiana, as well as a setup for our later cases dealing with Louisiana Tort Claims Law applied to federal government cases on flooding. Raw oysters, the quintessential Louisiana delicacy. They're briny, salty, and have a tinge of petroleum flavor, so we know they're Louisiana oysters. This is the bug that got people really interested in oyster-borne illness. Vibrio vulnificus, it's also known as the flesh-eating bacteria, and it suddenly changed the complexion of oyster-borne illness from chronic illness, something that causes chronic illness to something that can cause sudden death. Remember from our discussion of the discretionary function exception under the Federal Tort Claims Act, the courts use a very broad notion of discretionary function. That's because the U.S. Constitution has strong sovereign immunity as expressed in the Appropriations Clause, and when the courts construe statutes that limit this broad constitutional immunity, they construe them very narrowly. Key point is under federal law, even abuse of discretion is covered. And as we saw in Allen, there's no duty to protect the public, and the Federal Tort Claims Act will shelter intentional and or knowing decisions that injure the public. That's upsetting to a lot of people, and so we'll see, including state legislatures. The United States Tort Claims Act does not have a very clear definition of what's excluded and the courts use kind of a common sense notion of automobile accidents and the like as being excluded from the discretionary function exemption defense. State Tort Claims Act all include some version of the discretionary function exception. The real difference is the state laws apply the discretionary function to a narrower set of actions. States are, on balance, more suspicious of government action than is, are the federal courts. In most states, the test boil, comes down to a public versus private actor test. Is the action something that's uniquely a state action, something only government can do? Or is it something that a private party might also do? Classic example of the private versus public distinction is construction of highways. Under the Federal Tort Claims Act, the design of a highway, the choices that are made to balance safety against cost, which could include whether you have trees in the median of the highway, which are environmentally sound and reduce, sa reduce sound transmission, but stop cars in a lethal way, or whether the highway uses cable barriers and cleared medians, all of these choices would fall clearly under the discretionary function exception. Even a lot of choices about the surface cons uh, and construction of the highway would fall under discretionary function exception. On the other hand, in most states, highway design, which is something that is often done by private companies, in fact, in many cases, the highway design is contracted to private companies, is seen as a, an action that is not uniquely a state decision. It's a pri it can be a private action, and the courts tend to exempt it from coverage of the discretionary function exception. The result is that states are liable for highway design questions and there's significant tort liability associated with this. This limits a lot of choices the state can make about highway design and the costs and benefit analysis. We saw this in the litigation after the 1983 flood in Baton Rouge where the state was sued for designing I-12 in a way that created a dam and flooded some additional neighborhoods that might or might not have flooded in the absence of the I-12 design. That would clearly have been a discretionary function exception if 
for the federal government, but the state courts found that the state was liable for that design decision. Now let's look at the Louisiana Constitution. This is Section 10, Suits Against the State. This is part of the 1974 revision of the Constitution. That was during Governor Edwin Edwards' reign. Section 10A, No Community in Contract and Tort. This provision abolishes sovereign immunity for tort and contract actions, uh, including injury to property as well as persons. So Louisiana does not have sovereign immunity in its constitution, uh, at least as regards injuries to persons or property and contract claims. However, Section B, Waiver and Other Suits, allows the legislature to expand this uh, waiver of immunity into other areas if the legislature chooses. Now, there's a limitation on the abolishment of sovereign immunity. This paragraph appears to say that while the Constitution has abolished sovereign immunity, that the legislature, by law, may limit or provide for the extent of liability. So the legislature appears to be able to reinstate immunity through legislation. Uh, as we'll see, there are some implications for how this would lead to a different construction than the Federal Tort Claims Act, but at least based on this constitutional provision, it looks like the legislature can fairly clearly regulate the level of immunity for government actors in Louisiana. The Louisiana Constitution requires the legislature to set up a procedure to file lawsuits against the state, the state agencies or political subdivisions, and to provide for the effect of a judgment. So the legislature is directed to create a civil procedure mechanism for suing the state. There's an important caveat, though, that looks more like the U.S. Constitution's Appropriations Clause. No public property or public funds shall be subject to seizure. So this will raise questions about what happens if you have a judgment and the legislature doesn't want to pay it. We'll see more about that in the next section of the Constitution. The, when the Constitution was adopted, there were tort claims actions in process, and the, this constitutional provision provides that whatever limitations the legislature adopts will apply to existing cases as well as future claims. Final section really mirrors the U.S. Constitution's Appropriations Clause in saying that no judgment against the state, state agency, or political subdivision shall be payable, extendable, payable, or paid except from funds appropriated, therefore, by the legislature or by the political subdivision against the, which the judgment is rendered. So you can't sue, seize property to enforce a judgment. You can't seize money from the general fund. It has to be funds specifically appropriated to pay the judgment. We'll see that this provides the most powerful immunity for the state of Louisiana. It just doesn't appropriate money to pay judgment in tort claims act cases if it doesn't want to pay the money. And they have refused to pay substantial verdicts, including the case over the flooding caused by I-12 in the 1983 Baton Rouge flood. We learned from the Federal Tort Claims Act and the cases construing it, particularly Dalhite, that when you have baseline of sovereign immunity and a statute that limits the sovereign immunity, the courts will construe that statute very narrowly. In Louisiana, we have the opposite situation. We have constitutional provisions saying there is no sovereign immunity.
and thus the legislature will construe any statutes that recreate sovereign immunity very narrowly. So in the Federal Tort Claims Act, if you fall outside of the act, there is immunity and you can't sue. In Louisiana, if you fall outside of the act, the state is liable and the federal and the Louisiana Tort Claims Act provisions don't limit your claim. So let's look at what the section 2798.1, which is effectively the DFE for the Louisiana Tort Claims Act. We have a broad definition of public entity, state, its branches, departments, office, agencies, etc. This would probably include LSU. This is a key provision. Liability shall not be imposed on public entities or their officers or employees based upon exercise of performance or the failure to exercise or perform their policy making or discretionary acts when such acts are within the course and scope of their lawful powers and duties. This looks, it's not the same language as the Federal Tort Claims Act, but it's very close. Now we'll see whether subsequent sections really change the meaning of this. Section C modifies subsection B and creates exceptions. First, acts or omissions which are not reasonably related to the legitimate government objective for which the policy making or discretionary power exists. Now, one can think of this in several different ways. One is that it's illegitimate actions by the government but another is that it's actions which are not uniquely government actions, i.e. the public versus private distinction. So Louisiana, this is often also called operational versus policy choices. The courts look at what the agency is doing and if it's just carrying out day-to-day -day activities, which is the rationale used in the Icy Bridge case that we'll look at, then that's not a policy decision under the state Tort Claims Act. The other is acts or omissions which constitute criminal, fraudulent, malicious, intentional, willful, outrageous, reckless, or flagrant misconduct. Intentional is really the key word here because that would in essentially involve almost any choice um, that within this context uh, is an abuse of <coughs> discretion. Now we know under the Federal Tort Claims Act, abuse of discretion is specifically covered by the discretionary function exception. The primary reason for that is if abuse of discretion isn't covered, then that becomes a way to challenge almost any government action in court by litigating whether it was an abuse of discretion. That's the situation we see in Louisiana. So what does all of this mean? The legislature is telling us that this is not intended to reestablish any immunity based on the status of the sovereign, but really to clarify the substantive content parameters of the application of such legislatively created code articles. What it's really telling us is that its legislative purpose is not to reinstitute sovereign immunity. So when the courts are construing this statute, they're supposed to construe it within the context of the state policy not being to have sovereign immunity. That means the legislature will construe it narrowly to find liability whenever possible. There are a lot of other liability waivers in the code. This is just a subset of them. You get the idea that rather than a fairly simple system as in the Federal Tort Claims Act uh, with a general act that applies to all agencies, Louisiana has gone a different direction and has created specific legislation every single time uh, any interest group is able to convince the legislature that it ought to have some modification of liability. 
while all of these are relatively similar in construction, they all have slightly different terms. So in Louisiana, if you're going to bring a tort case against anything that might be covered by this, and it's not just government actors, it's all sorts of things, you're going to need to be familiar with the specific provisions of the code liability waiver. Louisiana doesn't have the administrative claims process in most tort claims. You just go to court. You don't have to file an administrative demand. However, medical malpractice cases in Louisiana are subject to some pre-litigation screening requirements and some other procedural requirements. These are also applied to medical malpractice cases against Louisiana government entities. And there's some specific legislation on suing Louisiana government entities for medical malpractice that you'll need to comply with. It does have a notice and an administrative process. Now, let's look at a high, specific highway example from Louisiana. This is a case involving a person who was injured on an icy bridge. Uh, the bridge was not closed. He spun out on the bridge. A car following him hit his car, knocked him over the bridge, killed the occupants of the following car. His claims were that the state was negligent in not closing the bridge. And more particularly, the state was negligent in choosing to use its highway personnel to do other things rather than close that bridge. Under the discretionary function of the Federal Tort Claims Act, this would clearly be sheltered. A decision by the highway department on how to allocate personnel in emergency situations um, is a clear discretionary function, at least under the federal law. State law, however, uh, is much narrower, and the Louisiana court actually found that the highway department has a duty to protect the public, which is something we do not find in the federal law, and it doesn't get discretionary function exception for decisions on deploying resources involving highway safety. More critically, the plaintiff can bring in experts and contest the decision of the highway department to close other bridges or sand other bridges as opposed to the particular one that he was on. This is a relatively recent case and it's a good illustration of the profoundly different effects of discretionary function exception uh, under state law versus Federal Tort Claims Act. This takes us to Gregor versus the Argento Great Central Insurance Company. As you discussed in your torts class, Louisiana is unusual in allowing direct action against the insurance company rather than just the action against the uh, uh, defendant. Let's think about what oysters eat. They're bottom feeders, they're filter feeders. They sit on the bottom of the bay filter out organic matter from the water, mostly particulate matter. Uh, we know from environmental law in Louisiana that that particulate matter includes a lot of the waste from chemical plants and sewage treatment facilities. Oysters have always been associated with foodborne illness. The traditional agent was hepatitis A. This causes liver disease, uh, can result in chronic illness in some people. Some people die from it. Uh, it's a fairly prolonged course. We don't tend to notice the direct link between eating the oysters and getting the hepatitis A, although there have been some significant uh, oyster-related hepatitis A outbreaks. Um, this has just generally been considered one of the acceptable risks for eating raw oysters. Over the last several decades, we've seen some new, more virulent agents introduced into our ecosystem. One of these is Vibrio vulnificus. This causes acute liver disease. 
may cause your liver to fail, which will either kill you or require a liver transplant. If the Vibrio gets into your skin through a cut while you're out in playing in the ocean or swimming or fishing, uh, it can cause massive gangrene. That's why it's also known as the flesh-eating bacteria. Uh, there are other nasty Vibrios. This is the same family that brings us cholera. It's where we have the notion of R months and oysters. R months meant the ones that are in the winter, that oysters are safer in cold water. Sadly, in the Gulf of Mexico, the water never gets very cold. This is not like Massachusetts or Seattle oysters. And with climate change, the water is staying warmer in the winter. This increases the risk of Vibrio vulnificus and other extremely dangerous foodborne illness agents. So climate change is making the oysters significantly more dangerous in warm water areas. Um, this is a good reason why we have deep fat fryers. Now oysters have always been dangerous. The most obvious and frequent danger is breaking a tooth on a piece of shell. Classic tort law, we look at foreign objects and food under the foreign natural distinction. So we have cherry pits and cherry pie, chicken bones. These are natural things that you should expect. That includes pieces of oyster shell. If you bite into a screw that's fallen out of the air conditioning duct in the kitchen, that doesn't fall into the natural uh, category and there can be liability for that. More broadly, the courts are looking at the consumer expectations test. Is whatever happens because of the food something a reasonable consumer would expect to be in the food? This raises a hard question. What's consumer expectation for hepatitis A? Uh, oh, an intelligent consumer should expect to get hepatitis A from oysters. On the other hand, very few people actually expect it much more significant for Vibrio vulnificus. Do consumers expect that they are running a small but real chance of death or permanent disability every time they eat a raw oyster? On the other hand, think about the, the delicacy in the sushi world of fugu, puffer fish, where the whole thrill of eating the puffer fish is the chance that the chef will have screwed up and prepared it and the neurotoxin will kill you. Now, from a pure tort analysis, oyster producers and restaurants should want a statutory warning. Statutory warnings create assumption of risk. The trade-off is that they are more have been more worried about scaring customers off than being sheltered from liability if the customer becomes sick or dies. The legislature empowered the, the health department to warn people about oysters and this has been incorporated into the sanitary code. And let's look very specifically at the warning. There may be a risk associated with consuming raw shellfish. That's certainly true, as is the case with other raw protein products. Well, raw protein products in this case really means animal proteins. It's not so dangerous to eat raw protein from plants. So this would also include steak tartare and other raw meat um, products. The next paragraph is an interesting compromise if you suffer from chronic illness of the liver, stomach, or blood, or have other immune disorders, you should eat these products fully cooked. Now, I believe that a more honest appraisal would be if you would like to avoid suffering from chronic illness, etc., you should eat these products fully cooked. They pose a risk to everyone, but the risk is significantly worse if you already have a chronic illness of the liver, stomach, or blood, uh, 
or other immune disorders, and that would obviously include either HIV or immunosuppression from immunosuppressive drugs. That could be secondary to transplants or cancer therapy or arthritis therapy. All of these folks are at significant risk if they get uh, a, a raw oyster containing a dangerous bug like the Vibrio vulnificus. Now let's think about what this means in terms of assumption of the risk. If you see the warning and you have the chronic illness and you get sick and die, you were clearly warned and you assume the risk by going ahead and eating the oyster. The waiter's not required to grill you on your health status and, and refuse to serve you raw oysters. On the other hand, if you don't have a chronic illness or an immune disorder, you could read that waiver and believe that you were that it was perfectly safe to eat raw oysters. In that case, if you're one of the unlucky few who gets seriously ill, um, you really have not assumed the risk of eating those oysters and you'd probably have a reasonable lawsuit against the restaurant. So if Gregor had been healthy, um, it's not clear that he'd have a claim against the state because the state duty is really about putting forth this warning to people with chronic illnesses. In this case, plaintiff did have a pre-existing illness. He ate the raw oysters, he got Vibrio vulnificus, and he died. What's interesting is he died in a hurry. He died in such a hurry that he either had a massive dose of the Vibrio or he contracted it somewhere else. Maybe he ate a raw oyster earlier in the week. Very hard to tell because he's dead. The warning sign was post posted at the oyster bar, but the plaintiff ate at a table in the dining room. Again, it would have been interesting to know whether he'd seen the sign, because if he had actual notice, then that would defeat his claim. But since we can't depose him, we have to work on the assumption that he didn't see the notice. Problem was that the restaurant had not put the warning at the point of sale, which at this case, in this situation was at a table in the dining room, and that the health inspector knew this, did not cite the restaurant, did not require the restaurant to put the warnings at the table. The plaintiff has sued the restaurant and the Department of Health and Hospitals for negligence in not putting the sign at the point of sale. This is in effect a negligence per se case because it's the sanitary code itself that sets the standard that the warning should be at point of sale. Uh, the trial court found liability and assigned liability 75% to health and hospitals and 25% to the restaurant. Health and hospitals appealed claiming discretionary function exception. Now let's look fairly carefully at the state's discretionary function exception claim. Health and Hospitals argues that the testimony and evidence establishes that the intent of the drafters of the sanitary code was to give health inspectors discretion when inspecting restaurants. And we'll look at the code in a minute and see if we agree with that. Health and Hospitals argues that the actual words of the regulation offer a variety of methods for compliance, which would require the use of judgment or choice. And in fact, it does say that you can use signs, menu notices, or table tents. And a fourth general alternative that if signs, menu notices, or table tents aren't appropriate in a particular situation, there needs to be some other kind of warning. So perhaps if you're at a, a reception at the restaurant and a waiter is circulating with a, with a tray of raw oysters, 
the waiter should individually warn each person about the danger of eating the oysters. The problem is that when we look at the specific regulation, what it says is that establishments that sell or serve raw oysters must display a prescribed warning at point of sale. So there's discretion in determining how you display the warning, but there's no discretion in displaying the warning at the point of sale. Now we've seen this situation before in the Berkowitz case where the court found that the Food and Drug Administration violated its own regulation by spot checking batches of polio vaccine rather than by testing every batch of polio vaccine. In this case, the agency is arguing that the reg does not apply, at least under its plain reading. And the court is looking at this much as the Berkowitz court does, that it finds that if there's a reg, you have to follow the reg. It, unless the reg specifically prefer, <clears throat> preserves discretion, as happened in the Varig Airlines case, then the reg eliminates your discretion. When you read the case, though, it's fairly confusing. The majority discusses the previous Fowler case, and it says that it rejects the Fowler case's reliance on Berkowitz because the L.A. statute is different. And when we looked at the L.A. Tort Claims Act, it clearly is structured quite differently than the Federal Tort Claims Act regarding the application of discretionary function exception. Although for the particular question here, which is whether discretion is extinguished by a statute or reg, there really isn't a fundamental difference between the Federal Tort Claims Act and the Louisiana Act. So the court goes on to analyze the Gregor case using the same test as in Berkowitz. We get more confusion from the concurrences and the dissents. Two judges thought Fowler was right in assuming that the Louisiana discretionary function exception should be construed the same way as the federal one, but they disagreed on how Fowler handled the facts and thought Fowler might be wrongly decided because of the factual analysis. One of the judges can, who conferred just that she didn't think Fowler was right was right about the discretionary function uh, in Louisiana being like the federal one. We have two dissents, only one gave reasons. He disagreed with the definition of point of sale. He thought that point of sale was a flexible notion and that the restaurant knew best in how to warn the customers and that it was okay for the health inspector to defer to the restaurant. Now under his analysis, if the warning failed, which we assume it did in this case, then the restaurant would be 100% liable rather than there being liability for health and hospitals. The court did find that the real negligence of health and hospitals was failing to train their personnel in the interpretation of the sanitary code terminology, specifically as to what the term point of sale means. This is a very insightful holding. This really wasn't about a health inspector exercising discretion after analyzing the code in the situation. This is about the general low quality of the training and procedures for the health inspections in Louisiana. Uh, you should carry this away when you're thinking about eating raw oysters or other extremely dangerous substances in restaurants such as warm soup that's not boiling hot. Now, restaurant liability is an interesting question. It turns out that the oysters did not come from where the restaurant thought they did. We have the issue that these were bad oysters. Was there could there have been liability along the chain of distribution, but that wasn't brought up in this case. 
the law had been in effect for quite a while. There had been a lot of talk about the risk of oysters in Louisiana. The restaurant clearly had enough information to know that it was important to warn customers. Uh, result of this, the court upped the allocation of fault to the restaurant and reduced the allocation to health and hospitals. So to wrap up, Louisiana has abolished sovereign immunity, which means that the courts construe the, stat the Louisiana Tort Claims Act in a way that increases liability. And in the federal system, the courts construe the Federal Tort Claims Act in ways that narrow liability. However, since Louisiana has gone to the specific liability waivers for dozens, if not hundreds, of special interest groups, tort lawyers practicing in this area will need to be familiar with whether any of those specific statutory provisions apply in the case they're going to bring. Just to test your knowledge, think through the difference about operating in a regime with sovereign immunity versus not having sovereign immunity. And think about whether the Gregor case really looks like Berkowitz despite the fact that the Louisiana tort claim statute differs somewhat from the federal tort claim statute.